Morning. It's nice to be down south. I'm from Teesside. <laughs> Don't hold that against me. Oh God, what a bad start. Okay. Progressive web apps have been around since sort of late 2015. And they give us capabilities for cross browser and platform applications that provide fast and engaging experiences. And the sort of experiences that they provide can be understood as akin to apps, native apps rather. So we've got all this lovely functionality like the ability to add to home screen, push notifications, that addictive little red button. Um, we can also consume content offline as a PWA user, and we can utilize modern APIs. Now, if we kind of compare that to the capabilities of a native app, or the capabilities of a traditional website, you can see that a PWA ticks all of the combined boxes, which is great. However, adoption hasn't been absolutely fantastic, as we might expect. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. One of those reasons being, if we think about the number of sites that have been around for quite a while that have invested in native apps, wow. They've done so because traditionally the web experience five or so years ago wasn't particularly friendly. We didn't have those capabilities of an app. A classic example of this is Pinterest to have a site and also invested it quite heavily in a native app. This is a fantastic study. So in 2017, they moved to a PWA. Um, this study is written by Adi Osmani, who is one of Google's chief kind of performance engineers, really knows his shit, follow him on Twitter, watch all of his videos on Google I.O. Um, Fluid Conf, he is awesome. So in the case study, um, loads and loads of things are addressed in there, but I think one of the most astounding benefits um, of a PWA is the saving in terms of size. So this is comparing the um, native app, the Pinterest native app performance. So on an Android, 9.6 meg, iOS, always shitter, 56 meg, and the PWA home feed is 150K, like an old BBC computer or something. That is staggering, right? But still, the adoption rate has been pretty slow. I mean, I know that that looks like a nice kind of bell curve there, good couple of thousand sites towards the end of 17, 18. But when you think about the size of the index web, so if we imagine that we've got 5.6 billion index pages, that's the size of the Burj Khalifa, the number of PWAs are the size of this kid's Wendy house here. So literally tiny. So why is that then? I think there's a number of reasons or a number of issues or difficulties. First off, it's a timing thing, right? We've got a load of brands, a load of sites that invested quite heavily a number of years ago in having a native app strategy and a website because they thought, our website is really shit on a mobile phone. We've got to have an app. Second reason, there's a lot of confusion within the industry and whenever we're talking to different brands about PWAs, they immediately think of SPAs, single page apps, useless stuff, um, or AMP. There's a bit of confusion between one and the other. It's not an either or. We can have all three. And there are different reasons and situations when you might still need to have a native app. Or you might want to use AMP with PWA, or PWAMP, as people call it. Sounds a bit weird. Also, the baseline requirements either can't or just won't be met. And it's really hard to retrofit some things. So you've ended up with a five-year-old site, which is a massive behemoth, with like 10 meg worth of JavaScript on it. It's never going to load in the kind of sub 10 second criteria. We need to wait until we can burn it to the ground and start again with a new build. So let's talk about why on earth we would want to do that, all of the benefits of PWAs. So first off, the big benefit really is that you've got cached assets. There's a number of reasons that this is such a big benefit. So as you build a relationship, I mean a digital relationship, um, with the web app, the more that we frequent or the more that we visit that, the more cached assets we have on our device, the quicker our consumption of that content is. So it's only new content that's being delivered to us for each URI request. So it's an immediate saving. 
All of that is refreshing in the background. So all of those requests are happening in the background. Your JavaScript bundles are kept completely lean, and that's often one of the biggest issues. Um, body content is loaded with JavaScript. Um, it means that your network payloads are massively reduced. But most importantly, the fastest network request is one that never happens, right? So there we go. So speed, of course, ultimately, is the objective here. And we all, I mean, there's millions and millions of different stats about why speed matters. I'm sure you've seen loads of them in loads of presentations. Um, but one of the criteria of a PWA in order to pass the checklist is having a sub 10 second CTFI or CI. So time to fully interactive. Um, time to first byte is literally pointless because we can't do anything with that. So we're shifting the kind of metrics in our framework of understanding what matters. So to get consistently usable, we've got to pass that kind of criteria. Second reason, or second benefit, if you like, is it gets us out of this mindset of having an app for the sake of having an app, or this kind of laziness of thinking, our web experience is shit, let's build an app to cope with that for people on mobile phones, which is a waste of time and a waste of resource and a kind of retro way of thinking. There's no point in doing that. Secondly, if we have this kind of ecosystem where we've got a site and an app, and the app does exactly the same thing as the site, then you've doubled all of your kind of overheads. You've doubled your dev team. You've doubled your requirements. You've doubled the amount of work you've got to do. Plus, if there's no store, there's no commission. You don't need to do any sort of dev and deploy 2x. Your site is discoverable by standard web optimization, SEO, as we should all be familiar. And there's no kind of deployment schedule like you would have if you're changing on a web app and then changing on a native app. So it's all kind of homogenized. Plus, the app kind of experience or our consumption of apps is pretty much dying. There are so many apps on the App Store that have never been downloaded. So many apps on the App Store that have been downloaded and absolutely never used. In fact, we all tend to use just three apps full stop, apart from maybe Slack for us lot. But ask any other consumer, they're using Facebook, um, Instagram, and WhatsApp. And that's literally it. So instead of outsourcing your success to the big three, PWA puts you in charge of your ability to drive your marketing growth. So I talked a little bit earlier about those app-like benefits of a PWA. And we talked about caching and the ability to load content instantly. But one of the second and most important benefits is this ability to load content offline, providing it's been cached initially. And this is fantastic, particularly if you look at um, a content website in particular, when a lot of content is consumed during commuting times, people sat on a train, hopefully not when they're driving, but reading and catching up on articles and things like that. If I go into a tunnel or lose my connection, I've still got that content, which is pretty neat. Um, you can also head to home screen, so it's instantly available, particularly on, I, um, on Android. On iOS, you have to do that manually. On Android, you get the prompt, iOS is a tiny bit behind, but it's um, adding more and more support for the full range of features, literally all the time. Um, and desktop support, so, you know, PWAs work on a desktop. Aspects of the functionality are quite annoying on a desktop, but, you know, you can't have it all. So how does this offline capability work? So it, it works through this JavaScript file called a service worker. And the service worker is like an air traffic controller, if you like. So it handles requests, it handles the data, it's the kind of man in the middle, taking the content and pushing it out to the device. Now, I've mentioned man in the middle. Technically, that can be compromised. <laughs> so it's something to watch out for, um, which is why being on HTTPS is an absolute requirement for a PWA. It's not a functional requirement. You can build a PWA in HTTP. It's a security requirement, as Starbucks found out the hard way. There's literally no information about this anymore, but at the time, sort of, I think, 15, 16, when they launched their PWA, they were on HTTP, and a hacker called, I forget his full name, Jason someone, um, found this out, and using um, a man-in-the-middle attack with the service worker, got himself a free coffee every day. 
you can't find any information on this anymore. I think Starbucks must have told him to take it down, but trust me, I was there, I saw it. Um, coffee for service worker. So push notification. Push notifications, <laughs> bit weird, right? This is a real divisive kind of thing. We are not normal, right? We are not the people, we are not the consumers. So I'm sure you all hate push notifications when we're sat at work on our desktop and you're trying to use the site and you get the allow push notification. Allow, put, like why the hell do I want Medium to send me push notifications or whatever. Um, but just remember that this, this isn't really for us. We shouldn't, or we, you know, we shouldn't be clicking on all the ads because we know. <laughs> the same as just ignore the push notifications. We don't experience these things in the same way as consumers might. So, for example, I might buy my clothes off two or three different websites. Don't go into a shop because who does that? Um, but if they are asking if I want to allow push notifications, I'm going to say hell yes because I want to know if there's a sale on or I want to know if there's special offers. So, from a consumer perspective. Push notifications are hella useful and also perform way better than email in terms of what we might consider the equivalent open rates and the equivalent metrics. However, you know, it's not going to take long, is it? I reckon within two or three years, we're going to have manual actions for push notification spam. So what I would say is if you are going to build the push notification functionality into your PWA, please, God, have a strategy. That is all. <laughs> so the next reason, um, we talked about security here, but this is also related. The whole ecosystem, if you like, the whole running spec is so much better in terms of performance. So we need to be on H2. Actually, hands up. How many people here are on or have migrated or work for sites that are now on HTTPS? <coughs> awesome. Keep your hands up. HTTPS people, everyone keep your hands up. If you are on HTTP2, ah, oh, shame on you. So those who put your hands down, congratulations, you made your site slower. HTTPS needs to be on H2. Otherwise, the latency impact of those SSL lookups really slows down your site. And of course, as well as all of the kind of benefits from that operating ecosystem, PWAs take advantage of much, much faster, lighter pass and compile times from JavaScript frameworks. There are loads more than these three. I just wanted the slide to look pretty. <laughs> um, have a look at that resource there on um, Hacker News. Again, Adi Osmani. Um, has a really good talk on there and put out a whole resource library on lots of different JavaScript um, frameworks that you can utilize. You can also make a full e-commerce PWA. And here's an example um, using this Mobify checkout payment request. So it's possible to go the whole way with a PWA. And as well, you can also submit it to the App Store, just like you would a native app. So if you have a look on um, the Play App Store and search for Erudite, not that you'd want to. Who wants to download a corporate website? But you know, you can see the concept. There's a few little hoops to get through, just like there, there is submitting a native app to the App Store, but it can be done. But in summary, it's all about the user experience. And the user experience always wins when it comes to the web. So we've got to get behind this. So how do we? So I've talked about some of the baseline requirements. There are around 11 or 12. They might change this every couple of months as to what is um, a critical requirement. But you can kind of summarize them in a number of ways. Is it secure? So yes or no. Um, HTTP 2 for multiplexing. So this is critical. Multiplexing is the ability to receive assets at the same time. It's an ancient technology. Um, sorry, not, not ancient. <laughs> Obviously, it's not a pyramid. But like, it's been around since the time of telephony systems. So if you think about a telegraph pole outside of your house, multiplexing is the technology that allows a single communication point to come in and then multiples to come out and deliver a signal to everybody's house. So it is ancient, really, isn't it? You know what I mean. So what I mean by that is instead of asset prioritization that you would get from single plexing, 
you get, so your JavaScript comes first, if ever, or whatever. Then you might get your images, then your CSS, or whatever the prioritization might be. With multiplexing, everything arrives pretty much simultaneously. JavaScript often fucks it up, but you know, it's better. And then the service worker. Does the service worker um, register? And then we've got all of the speed stuff. There's a couple of different speed um, requirements to fulfill, but the most important one is that sub 10 second TTFI CI. And actually, it's fairly easy if we're building from the ground up with a clean site. This is the hardest thing to retrofit, though, um, to kind of convert a site that's been around for a while to a PWA. And the rest we've talked about. So not all organizations can hit these baseline requirements. So I think that's one of the main reasons why we're not seeing really fast, aggressive adoption. So let's talk about some tools, measurements, that sort of thing that we can do to a check our PWA or build along the way. Lighthouse is literally the only tool we need now, um, either as a Chrome extension or just go straight into DevTools in the browser and run the audit from there. Make sure you clean your cache every time that you use this or go in incognito mode or something like that. Otherwise, you, you're, you, know, you get kind of janky results back. So make sure you do that every time because of all the asset caching and all the rest of the different caching that's occurring. It's important to just keep cleaning out. Otherwise, your results are polluted. So an audit report on Lighthouse will look like this. You've got lots of other different audits that are happening. The SEO one is basic, so just ignore that. Um, but you've also got the um, speed and accessibility. So there's lots of other good stuff in there. But the PWA one, in this case, is what we're talking about. But the main switch is that it's super performance focused. Um, and there's loads of really good audits that you can do in here, particularly things like looking at JavaScript weight. Um, and I don't care who you are, but most of us tend to have like a good 70% of JavaScript unused. I think the best thing to aim for is like 20%. I've seen some sites with like 90% unused JavaScript every audit. Um, and that's the thing that tends to cause most of the problem. We've also got the uh, PWA validation reports. It will tell you tick, 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 tick. Have I fulfilled all of those criteria? If yes, congratulations, you got yourself a PWA. You can list in the PWA directory, get a link for free without looking spammy. Um, you've got the app manifest, which is where you put all your pretty designs for your add to home screen and your app icons. And then the service worker is also in the app manifest as well. And to test your service worker, you have to make sure you force a disconnect because it needs to fire without a connection. So on an Android device, as I've mentioned, you can add to home screen. And we've also got those nice push notification things. We're always hiring, by the way. Um, but as I say, use them for good, otherwise we're all going to end up in a you know, mess of spam again in a couple of years' time. You can actually track your um, app installs as well using a nice little bit of JavaScript. So here I've got the event, the actual event listener, but you can also look for the outcome as well. So what did they do? Yes, no. Um, this is an absolutely fantastic resource for tracking all sorts of different PWA-specific events, because GA doesn't, by default, allow us to do that yet. So you can use JavaScript to pull some of that stuff in there and get a little bit more meat out of the data. Um, so do check that out. That's really cool. And there is also a whole course on Code Labs, the Google training resource, which I thoroughly recommend working through. So there's no excuse. So let's talk about SEO for PWA. This bit's super short, because it's just SEO. Basics, right? So each page has to have its own URL. Ta-da, we should be doing that anyway. This moves us away from that SPA sort of thing. They are not the same. Use of canonical tags, you know, self-referentials. We should be doing that anyway. Um, Schema.org, metadata, yeah, we should all be doing that anyway. And making the content shareable. <laughs> so it's just basics, right? We're all been doing that anyway. There's also some UX requirements. Again, just good practice stuff. So seamless page transmissions, um, making sure the content loads smoothly. We're not getting any jumps. Um, nice smooth scroll. And not, not excessive prompts for the app installs. Again, watch out for the spam notifications. And you can really, really easily build a PWA 
on WordPress. Two of my PWAs are on WordPress. Super easy. Um, a lady actually, a lady silly, uh, she recommends that one, Super Progressive Web Apps. Um, we tend to use or have utilized a kind of combination of a couple of them because we didn't find one that was perfect for absolutely everything that we wanted to do. So I've got one corporate site and one e-commerce site. The e-commerce site required a little bit of shoehorning, a bit of hand coding. Um, I'll explain a little bit about that later on. And as I've mentioned as well, you can utilize the two things together. It's absolutely not an either or, particularly if you're a content site. So you, your site can be a PWA, but there's still a good use case for having AMP pages as well. So it's best to think of it as AMP is start fast and PWA is stay fast. Um, Alayda's actually also got some really good resources on PWAMPs. I hate even saying that, so awkward. But if you look, search Alayda PWAMP, you'll get a whole list of resources, which are really cool. And also um, the Code Labs, the Google resource tutorial as well. However, we do need to talk about JavaScript because this is where we can come unstuck and where there can be some issues with PWAs. And it is particularly to do with um, client-side rendering of JavaScript. Um, this is, is this John? I can't even read my own writing. Not that I wrote it, but you know what I mean. Yeah, John Mueller. All right. So, um, what John is saying here is one of the most common mistakes or one of the most common sort of ways that people come unstuck with a PWA um, is utilizing client-side rendering. And this is where Googlebot does have some issues with crawling. Um, so Tom Greenaway at Google I.O. last year, so this is like pretty much exactly a year ago, um, talked about this in some depth, but um, highlights are, God, that's a long slide. So basically, blah, 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 JavaScript, JavaScript, Googlebot might index a page before the rendering is complete and the final render can actually arrive. What? So this is where we come against some problems. So in summary, don't overuse client-side rendering for JavaScript because you can come into issues with when that gets crawled. The two things are not tied together at the same time in the index and in the database. Um, audit your PWA with JS on and JS off. This is super important um, because it is possible to pass the PWA Lighthouse tool checklist. And this is why over-reliance on tools is sometimes a bit of a bad idea. So you end up with examples like this. So this into is actually in the Magento directory of PWA examples. Magento, you can get PWA on Magento now. All CMSs now are supporting this, all decent ones. Um, but if you disable JavaScript, they're not in there. Uh, yet, yeah, that passes an audit. So if you're looking to build a business case, let's have a look at a couple of live examples. Or for these live examples, the actual performance uplifts that they saw from pre to post migration. Um, so George of Asda loads almost four times faster, massive increase in CTR. Trivago, massive increase in add to home screen. The offline usage thing for me, that's the big benefit there. Um, Uber, like that's kind of incredible to think that the Uber uh, PWA is only like 50K. That's pretty insane. And a three second load. That's super hard. Like even I think our own corporate website, please don't look at it on, on conference Wi-Fi, but normally we get like a four second load. Um, so they've done some really good work there. Tinder, never heard of it. Um, five second load time from like 12, pretty awesome. And it's 90% smaller than the Android app. So in summary, I do personally believe that PWAs are the future of the mobile web. This is the title of a book. I didn't write it, but I do recommend having a look at that uh, by Google and Microsoft. So you know when Google and Microsoft do something, it, like it really is going to happen, isn't it? Like there's no avoiding it because these two large organizations are collaborating on standards and on direction. So, you know, we've got to get behind it. However, there's not a huge amount of smaller site examples out there. Um, which might be a little bit difficult if you're trying to base a business case off things like Tinder and Uber when you're uh, you know, 
an SME and you're trying to sort of say to somebody and they're saying, but we're nothing like Uber, we do not have their budget. Um, but there are some, there is a directory out there, PWA directory, as you'd imagine. There's some decent small site examples that you can find in there that will help you build a business case if the speed and other benefits are not enough. Number two, reason for adoption, it's harder to retrofit, as I've said. So you're probably going to have to wait for a digital transformation phase when people have the appetite and the budget to burn the existing site and app to the ground and rebuild from afresh with new spec. And third thing is just remember the client side rendering with the JavaScript issue and always audit your PWA with JavaScript on and off. And that's me, thank you very much. If you would like the slides, just give me a shout at the end and I'll email them. Thank you.